Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to all members of the Radley community and to any of our school partners who've joined us today on Zoom. My name's Caroline Monaghan and I'm responsible for our Beyond Radley Career Speaker Programme, a series of talks designed to give you a live insight into the world of work. A strong theme we want to focus on in these talks is that of entrepreneurism. And when I say entrepreneurism, I'm not talking just about starting your own business, but also about how important it is to think like an entrepreneur. Those who think like entrepreneurs grasp problem solving opportunities, like to think creatively, take risks, accept failure as part of the growth process, and appreciate the correlation between hard work and success. These skills are invaluable in any career. Now, Doug Carr has already spoken to you in a previous talk about the qualities that he thought that you needed to be a successful entrepreneur. And our guest speaker today is going to build on this theme further, talking about the mechanics of starting your own and growing your own business from scratch. Before we begin, a few reminders, please keep your microphones on mute. If you want to ask a question during the talk, then feel free to put it on the chat. There'll be a Q&A session at the end. These talk talks are recorded so that we can share them with others afterwards. Now, I'm going to introduce you to Nick Newbury. Nick is founder and CEO of Travel Brand, Original Travel, and he's going to talk about starting and scaling innovative businesses and brands from scratch. He'll cover raising finance, the importance of getting your infrastructure and your company structure right from the start, and we'll also identify some of the pitfalls to look out for along the way. Right, over to you, Nick. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Caroline. Um, I'm just going to quickly switch my thing to share screen. I assume I can do that now. Super. Um, so thank you, Caroline, for inviting me to speak today. And thank you all for taking the time to listen. Um, I'll start by saying that I've got two sons aged 11 and 9, both down for Radley, of course, and I sympathise entirely with the joys of homeschooling. Uh, my boys have taken great pleasure in somehow permanently changing my Google profile picture to Baby Yoda, so that's not ideal in a work Google Hangout. Um, so let's hopefully move on. Um, so today I'm going to briefly... Um, well, I'm going to briefly cover um, the foundation and growth story of Original Travel, a business I founded and led for 18 years until the end of 2019. Then, given the point of today is to understand launching and growing your own business, I'm going to attempt to put the very beginning of a plan together for launching a hypothetical brand over the course of about 15 minutes. Um, in an ideal world, we'd be doing the, these things in person and we could all get stuck into coming up with the ideas, but we'll just have to cope with Zoom. Um, and before I go on, I should say that um, I spent very, very happy years at Radley and I don't say this lightly in that I think Radley has played quite an instrumental part in founding my own business and I've not been paid to say that or anything like that, but it, it really, it, it, it's been a heavy part of, of me being where I am today. Um, I'm gonna finish off by reminding us all some of the key things which I hope you'll pick up in the presentation, which I believe to be crucial in founding and growing a business. Along the way, eight important words are going to pop up. And while I'm not a fan of acronyms, I've tried to make them easy to remember. So easy, in fact, that all these words start with the same letter, and that's the letter P. Um, and I know it probably sounds glib, but I really believe these eight words are the most crucial things to keep in mind when founding and growing a business. Before I get stuck into any of these things, I'm going to quickly whiz you through my background in the years since I left Radley in 91. I don't do this for sort of um, a bit of self-promotion. I'm going to do it because I think it should give you an insight into my mindset leading up to the foundation of original travel and then varying stages and ages I was at at the time. So after Radley, I did the cliché gap year, uh, walking in the Himalayas with my father and followed up by 10 months teaching in South America. Um, for some reason, I then finished up by being a pneumatic drill-wielding miner in a below-ground mine in the Andes. Um, and I put that entirely down to having had a really inspiring GCSE geology teacher when I was at Radley, um, Geo Dave, if any of you know Geo Dave, but he really is a phenomenal chap. Um, in both cases, these early long haul trips sparked a passion for adventure travel, which has grown ever since and been fundamental to the direction I chose in my working life. 
I went on to spend three very happy years at Durham, Durham University, where I spent the most amount of my time uh, rowing. So uh, that again is Radley leading on to Durham and I don't know, probably 40 hours a week of rowing training, which, which is very fun. Um, after Durham, I got onto the graduate training program of um, P&G, Procter & Gamble. Um, you probably know that Procter & P&G, sorry, is a huge American company, which makes a ton of everyday products like Fairy Liquid, Gillette, shaving stuff, Vicks, Pantene shampoo, that type of stuff. Um, and P&G tend to staff their new graduates, their new graduates on the biggest brands, as they know, it'd be pretty hard for a new graduate to make a mess of a household name like Gillette. Um, and this is how I found myself as a graduate trainee on the always feminine hygiene brand, which was a bit of an eye opener, um, but fantastic training and insight uh, for all sorts of reasons. Um, I then rather predictably followed many of my old friends into the city as a corporate financier, first at ING Bearings. Um, some of my fellow graduates had it very hard, but I was fortunate enough in that my boss hadn't started his own career in the city. He was a former board director of BP, and he believed passionately that presenteeism, essentially sitting at your desk at all hours if you don't really need to be there, was a problem, a real sickness which needed to be stamped out from city culture. I think he led the team brilliantly. We worked hard and we did some amazing deals, stock market flotations, acquisitions all over the world. And I, I think I put down his leadership as something that really played a part in, in um, the direction that I took later on in life. Um, and I think this is where the idea of my business starts to form in my subconsciousness um, or my subconscious. The city at the time was a place where if you were away from your desk for more than a week, you might find yourself coming back to no desk at all. Um, and the deals I, I worked on took me all over Africa, the Middle East, Russia, the US. And with all that travel, I tended to spend, extend my trip by a day or two, exploring somewhere, a bit off the beaten track. Friends and colleagues in the city then started to ask me questions about it and asked me to organize their own extensions so whether that was you know, a day or two exploring the skeleton coast in Namibia or a side trip to Siberia or whatever it was, I took a great pleasure in doing it. Um, and so I guess it was that point that the seed of a business idea began to form. At the same time, I was headhunted to another bank called Dresdner Kleinwalt Wasserstein, which is a nice mouthful, um, but to join the team doing one of the biggest flotations um, of mobile phone companies at the time, um, Orange, which everyone knows. Um, and in the enforced three months gap, the gardening leave between the two banks, I started to question my motivations and whether a long term career in the city was what I really wanted. Um, and this is going to sound quite trite, but I also began to look at my older colleagues, many of whom looked like they were a decade or two older than they were. Um, lots of money, yes, but aging and second and third marriages, excess all over the place. And it just didn't really feel very appealing to me. So although I recognised the huge value of what I was learning in the city, I started to think about what I was really passionate about and what was going to have me leaping to get out of bed in the morning. And passion is my first um, P word. Um, I think passion is the single most important thing that anyone can have in founding and growing a business. Um, and it seems like the other speakers that you've had in this series agree because I've heard that word come up again and again and again. Um, and I would really, I, I mean, if, I, if you come away with just one thing from the, today's presentation, passion, and whether that's actually running your own business or founding your own business or joining a company or, revising for your exams or whatever it is, you can throw passion into it, it makes all the world a difference. So I then joined Dresdner Bank, um, feeling a strong duty to do that orange deal I talked about. Um, but at the same time, the plans for my business were taking shape. I started business planning, came up with a brand name, financial models, working out who I might, might want to bring on to the business with me, scrabbling together what meager savings I had. And most importantly, developing a product and a proposition. Um, so original travel was the brand name. Short adventurous holidays was the product. And the big short break was the proposition. And I'll come back to the proposition later. 
but the next key word is product. And having a product or service which punches above its weight, and by this I mean quality, innovation, style, differentiation, price, or many other reasons is crucial. An average, or even worse, a poor product isn't going anywhere. So with the product idea formed, as soon as the orange deal was done, and this probably sounds incredibly disloyal, disloyal of me, a few months shy of my 30th birthday, I knew this was the moment. So the idea was firmly formed. Really importantly, in my mindset at the time, I, I felt I had minimal responsibility for anyone else. So yes, I was dating the person who's now my wife, but we weren't married, we didn't have children. In short, if my idea didn't work, I'd only really be negatively impacting myself. And even then, I knew the worst case would be that my fingers would have been burned, I'd have lost my savings, but I would have learned a lot. Um, and I knew I really couldn't have done any more planning at that stage, so I decided to take the leap. Before you join me in taking that leap into the next stage, you'll know that I've picked up my next P word is planning. Um, planning is crucial, not just in the pre-launch planning stage, but at every step along the way as the business develops. Of course, there's the fun, creative ideas planning. That's pretty easy to understand, and we'll come on to that. Then there's the boring but important planning, sometimes called governance, which is all about the smooth and professional running of the business, record keeping, accounts, minutes, roles, contracts, legals, responsibilities, company structure. And while this boring but important planning might not seem important at the start, I'm a firm believer that building those types of structural plans into your business from day one means you don't have to reverse engineer them, engineer them into your business at a later date. It also sets out your stall on how you run your business to, to your growing team, your clients, suppliers, your potential investors. And by this time, I persuaded two friends to join me. Three university friends, including me, obviously starting this business, friends. Why therefore, and my friends often ask me this, in those early months, did we need roles and responsibilities, planning, board meetings, accounts, contracts, expensive structural plans? They never asked me again after we attracted investment and started hiring the right people. So planning is crucial, particularly, as I said, that boring but important stuff, which often gets overlooked. And yes, I just said people, it will be a P word, but I'll come on to that later. So the original travel was formed. And I'll go into a little bit more detail on that very shortly, but fast forward a bit, and my 18 years as CEO of Original Travel came to an end after I'd sold the business right at the end of 2019. Along the way, in case you're wondering what um, that funny thing at the bottom there saying, Anseli Batisur is, it's the, I became a trustee of the parent company's um, charity foundation. And then finally, in terms of my career today, I've worked and still work in a handful of non-executive chairman and advisory positions. So. With Original Travel, I still act in an advisory capacity. And in addition, I advise the board of a business called What Three Words, which you may have heard of, which is a tech business which addresses every three meter square of the world with a unique combination of three words. And it gets used by e-commerce, delivery companies, navigation companies, emergency services, and, and much more. Um, I'm chairman of a business called Sharky and George. Um, some of you may have even had your own earlier year parties organized by them. Um, and I'm also chairman of a tech travel business called Sigati. So that's my career since Radley. Has it been the perfect path? Um, I'm sure it probably could have been a million times better, but I can honestly say that I wouldn't have changed the moment. Running your own business is one heck of a roller coaster, but I've learned a huge amount and love every minute. So to the point of today, starting and growing a business from scratch. We've already got quite a few of the key requirements in place, passion, product, and planning, and I've hinted at people too. Now I'm gonna use original travel as a case study, but what follows is not meant to be the guide on how to do it, far from it. It's just a taster of how we did it. Um, we made mountains of mistakes, and we still make mountains of mistakes, and there'll unquestionably be many, many, many examples of companies who've done it a lot better. Um, then, as I said earlier, we're going to attempt to theoretically launch a new brand over the course of about 10, 15 minutes, um, which is going to be a new energy drink, um, something I know nothing about, 
and one of the most competitive markets in the UK. So at the very first hurdle, I'm building it up. Um, I've got no passion for energy drinks, um, but let's just pretend I do for the sake of the, of the presentation. So in 2003, um, Original Travel's first proposition was, as I said before, the big short break. Big experience holidays of less than a week for those with deep pockets and very little time. And it went really well. Um, two years in, in 2005, our clients started also asking us for longer haul holidays and itineraries, which clearly sat at odds with our big short break proposition. So knowing the importance of having a clear proposition, we therefore turned these offers to spend thousands of pounds, tens of thousands of pounds with us away. And along with it, the loyalty of our clients. Um, so in our obsession to keep our proposition pure, it took us way too long to evolve our offering, but inevitably we did. The big short break became part of what we did, and instead we focused on the word original in our brand name. Originality was the essence of our business, and we aimed to deliver it to all the holidays, whether they were short break or, or long haul. So having a clear proposition is crucial. Um, a, proper, a proposition describes the overarching promise of a product, service, or a company to the market. So trying to be everything to everyone quickly becomes a mess. Your brand architecture loses its focus and it massively dilutes the potency of the minimal resource you will likely have in terms of time, like people and money, the money you're frantically trying to make go a long way to promote your idea. So knowing how important a proposition is, we're gonna spend a moment building a proposition for our hypothetical business later on. But for original travel, its proposition, as I said, was the big short break. It grew into something else. And over the last seven years, it's been what we call life is in the detail, which as you can see in the strap line is under the brand name at the top. Life is in the detail means that original travel's offering life enhancing, sometimes even life changing holidays where the detail is absolutely crucial. And the point there is that time is way too short to bog things up for our clients, um, to bog up the detail essentially. So Original Travel's got three brands, the main Original Travel brand, a diving offering and a brand looking after inbound holidays into the UK. And as you can imagine, none of them are exactly thriving at the moment. Um, I've covered up most of the details on this slide, largely because I'll get shot if they were all there, but you'll see that pre-COVID, the business was going along very nicely, growing in every year since launch, going from nothing to about 20 million pounds in 2019, at which point we had about 80 staff. And along the way, we raised some money from venture capitalists, um, sometimes called private equity. We acquired a couple of businesses. We launched a couple of brands. We won some awards. Um, we hired some great people who've lived in all parts of the world. And people is very much another of my crucial keywords. Surrounding yourself with great people is up there with one of the most important things you can do. Um, and if you need proof of something like that, um, some of you, I'm sure will, you, you'd have probably been very young at this but time, but 2003, actually you really would have been young, 2003, the World Cup um, rugby winning team, um, the England rugby winning team, Clive Woodward um, used to bang on about this the whole time. Um, I think Clive Woodward is a great people manager. He insisted on surrounding himself with great people in that and in that in that squad and he's a great example also of a control freak and i can assure you that i've also got a pretty serious case of control freakery uh, myself but there's no getting away from the fact you can't do everything yourself and without working alongside passionate emotionally intelligent people who are specialists in their field another key word specialists and the whole thing will end up becoming uh, or you'll wear it on your own shoulders so Passion starts to wane when you're weighed down with everything, I can tell you. Um, in 2017, we were acquired by what I believe to be the most sophisticated travel company in the world, a French company called Voyageur du Monde. Um, Pre-COVID, pre they had a valuation on the French stock exchange of about half a billion euros. Um, and I then fully exited the business pre-COVID, which I've got very mixed feelings about in that it was very lucky timing on the money front, um, literally sort of two weeks before news started to hit about COVID, um, but obviously feeling very sad in my advisory capacity at the current travel situation. Um, 
So Nick, Nick sorry, can I just interrupt yes. you there? I've got a question. There. It's actually a, a burning one for me as well. Why did you decide to sell? Um, so, gosh, a number of reasons. So the opportunity at the time was that um, two, two real factors here. One was that uh, we were backed by private equity who bought an enormous amount of um, expertise into our planning side of the business and getting, if you like, the structure of the business right. But where they began to get a little bit tiring was that they weren't bringing a lot of strategic ideas to the business. Um, so we initially thought about trying to buy the private equity company back out again. And completely out of the blue, we were approached by this business called Voyage du Monde in France, who I, to be honest, hadn't really heard of before. Um, they came to flirt with us in London. We nipped over to Paris. And I, and I just knew the second I crossed, and I, this, isn't a, a, I'm, this isn't meant to be a cliche at all, but I stepped across the threshold of this office and I just knew, having thought we knew it all, to be honest, I, I stepped over the threshold and I thought we had so much to learn and it just, it just oozed something that I'd never come across before in all the years I'd done original travel and all the companies I'd met in the travel industry in the UK and, and in the US. It, it was just a different level. So I thought, wow, we've got a heck of a lot to learn here. They also wanted to use original travel as a vehicle to, um, to expand into the English speaking world, which you may then say, well, why on earth did you, did you go? Well, the going bit, funnily enough, is down to two reasons, and they're both personal. So one, unfortunately, not, not meant to be um, a uh, no joke here, but dad, another P, P word, my father has Parkinson's disease. Um, we live up in North Norfolk, and I was spending four days a week, four nights a week, sorry, apart from my wife and family. And my father needed quite a lot more support up here, which is, I think I was in touch with you about earlier this week, Caroline. Anyway, one of my children, last note, sorry, November 2019, was doing his usual feel on a Sunday night saying to me, Daddy, why do you have to head off to London? Why do you have to be away from us all week? And I gave the usual spiel back. Anyway, next morning, I tiptoed out of the house about five o'clock in the morning, tiptoed to the gate, frozen to, to turn the windscreen heaters on the car, tiptoed to the gate, opened the gate, came back to the car, started driving to the station. And about 15 minutes into my journey, my son popped up out of the boot. He'd stowed away. Um, and my then seven-year-old son popped out of the boot. And he said, Daddy, I've got it. I'm coming to work. Add original travel and I'm going to come and live with you in London and I just thought to myself crikey do you know what this is this is a moment I'm going to this this time is going to pass and I'm going to launch a business in the US which I've done and I'm going to build it up and then I'm going to come back and the children will be boarding at Radley and I'll never see them again um, and you know my father may well have passed on to you know another world and I just thought no life's too short so I had an option to sell at the end of 2019, which I took them through. They um, were perfectly happy to work with me because it was a legal requirement. I said, I'll carry on and advise the business, stay very closely connected to it. And, and so that was that. But I still feel enormously connected to it um, and you know, very happily guide it. Hopefully that answers your question. Does that answer your question? It does. Thank you. Thank you for your Thanks. honesty. Um, for sharing so before you make the leap, whatever stage of life you're at, you should really be able to answer this next question and understand your purpose, another P word, or, or why you're taking that leap. Um, so the most important thing is passion. It has to be there for the business to have the best chance of succeeding. But why else are you doing it? Is it purely the passion? Um, or is it to create and build something? Um, is it for the cold, hard money? Um, is it the need to be in charge or to be in charge of your own destiny or is it for freedom whatever that might mean for you for me it came down to a combination of passion and freedom i guess answering your question you asked me a second ago carol i wouldn't have had that freedom to to make the decision i was able to do had i don't not do it done had not done it um then the building the business and leading and money and all those sorts of things were byproducts so I think it's really important that you need to have a really clear answer to this why question before you take the leap. Really, what is that purpose? Now, I'd love to take you through the summary of many years of strategic launch and development planning for original travel, but A, I'd be breaking all sorts of confidentiality rules 
um, if I did, and B, because I had a nice message yesterday from one of Original Travel's competitors, who's also a Radley parent, and who I think might be on this call, so um, I, you'll have to just settle with our theoretical energy drink launch, I'm afraid. So, as I said, I'm going to be totally bluffing my passion for energy drinks um, in this exercise, but I'm going to attempt to show you how one might start on this challenge. And my effort here, I must say, is fairly lame, so you'll just have to go with me on it. Um, I call it Spartan, probably a really rubbish name, but let's go with it for these purposes. Um, so I've come up, first of all, with the elevator, elevator pitch, a brief persuasive sentence, which one hopes sparks interest in what we're all about. So I've said here, Spartan is a range of 10 entirely natural, premium, performance optimizing energy drinks with a range of benefits which have been scientifically created to perfectly suit the needs of people who love sport. Not perfect, okay, but it's a start. Um, then how we do it, by combining the insights of high performance athletes and sports scientists with the exceptional botanical knowledge of our nutritionists. So we're on the way to knowing what the business is and how we do it. Next thing to ask yourself is how you differentiate. And this is an exercise I really, really like. Um, so we're gonna try and build a simple competitor map. Um, and you can use this approach for so many things and I'll, I'll show you how. So first of all, we're gonna draw an axis down the page, in this case with youthful audience at the top of the page and mature audience at the bottom of the page. Now we're gonna plot the points signifying the range, let's say, where your product sits on that axis. So in this case, we're saying that we're probably weighted a little bit more to a youthful audience than a mature audience, but we're still picking up a little bit of an older audience as well. It's not meant to be numerically spot on where it sits on the axis, it's just a, an indication. Then you start to add more axes and more ranges, and you just join the dots, and you get a picture across those different axes where your market sits. Now, I'm gonna do that now with Coca-Cola. Um, so you can see that Coca-Cola is sugary, cheap, and an everyday drink for all. Um, I'll layer on Red Bull now, who are a much more youthful product than Coca-Cola, higher cost, with a hint of technical feel coming into it. And that's largely because of their sponsorship of extreme sports and events. Um, here's Tenzing, in my opinion, uh, which you probably know Tenzing, which is a, I think we're going to call a key, key competitor, in, competitor in our launch of Spartan. They're pricier, strong on the natural scale, but still very sugary and caffeine filled. Um, and then finally, I'm going to put our brand, Spartan, on. So it's big on the left-hand side of the chart, technical, natural, um, fairly premium as well. Chuck the whole lot together, and here's a flavor of where the air is clearer. Now, clearly right in the middle, it's very crowded. Um, and I appreciate this is a massive simplification. There are hundreds of energy drinks out there, but you'll, you'll get what I'm trying to do. And yes, we want to be a, a drink that's drunk by, in, you know, sort of on an everyday basis. And yes, it's also there for younger and older audience alike, but where it stands out is the extent of its natural ingredients, in the sort of bottom left-hand corner, the technical nature of its science and its lower price point by comparison to Tenzing. So now we know where we're going to focus our resource. Um, and focusing your mineral, minimal resource on those points of difference, okay, not quite a key word on its own, but a key phrase, and aiming this message at the right people gives you a far more effective laser focused approach to marketing your, your message. Um, all well and good so far. Um, and it's you know, important to obviously know those points of difference, but it's also crucial to know who your clients are. You're gonna do that through surveys, tests, focus groups, analysis of your signups, basically as much as you can to get to know your clients. Now we're gonna move on to brand vision, proposition, essence, and positioning. And I think you probably see the next key word coming up here. So the brand vision, really key to, to have that in place. And I very distinctly make the difference between a brand vision and a commercial vision. Commercial vision is all about 
the, what you're trying to generate in terms of money, profit, revenue, gross margin, that sort of thing. Brand vision is much more about what the brand is going to really you know, objectify here is to offer the most scientific, technical, natural and delicious range of energy drinks in the market for a range of active people to professional athletes. The proposition, I've had a go at it here, so to bring out your inner speed, strength, endurance, parity. Um, so that's equivalent to Original Travel's Life is in the Detail. Then the brand essence is also crucial. So Original Travel's, for example, is to be thoughtful in all that we do. That means how we deal with clients, each other, with an interview candidate, with the postman when it comes to collect the mail. Everything. Innocent smoothies is a great example of a brand with a strong essence. You walk into their office and you walk into it. It, it feels a bit like an alpine meadow. You instantly guess it. It's, it's, it's grass. It's cows. It's, it just feels innocent. Um, to start for Spartan, I'm going perhaps rather unimaginatively, unimaginatively with energy. Next up is positioning, which is the next P word. And positioning is super important and shows that you're meeting the unique needs and mindset of a particular audience, demonstrating empathy and our understanding of what they want. And what is our audience looking for here? I think they're looking for understanding that the people behind Spartan really understand what I need as a customer. Um, that's not gonna damage my health, so we're really honest. Um, it really is going to improve my performance or recovery. Um, it's going to give me confidence when I'm going out there and doing my sports and activities. That the people behind it are passionate, that it tastes good, and that it is affordable. It's not going to break the bank. Um, those key points of difference we've talked about before, so I won't, I won't go over those in any great detail. And you throw that all together, and oh, the last line, which I'll come to in a minute, you've got something which looks like a picture of what this brand might be, what this business might be. It's objective, it's point of difference, it's essence, it's positioning, it's proposition. The strategy, as you can see, if you really strain your eyes down there, it's full of a whole load of Latin. Um, Laurum Ipsum, et cetera, et cetera. Laurum Ipsum is a, is a, you probably know this, but it's a standard bit of copy that printers and content writers use when they don't really know what's quite gonna go in there. And I just thought that um, given uh, given where we got to here would be really making it way too theoretical if I started to sort of strategize this business. But you can imagine you might have two, three, four, five key strategies that are going to drive all of this great arrowhead forward and, and build the business. Um, and now something we haven't talked about much yet, the money word, and which is my final P word, profit. Um, and it's clearly a factor for a sustainable business to be able to reinvest either in itself or return a payout to its investors, but it's not a strategy in itself. Profit comes as a result of really going for it with all the P words we've used so far. So quickly recap, recapping, and I can assure you there's no shoehorning words in the presentation beginning with P here. It's just worked out like that. And I hope it makes it easy to remember. So passion you need in spades. Product, you need something that punches way above its weight, or at least above its weight. Planning, not forgetting that boring but important stuff, because uh, your future backers, investors and buyers will pay you handsomely for the boring but important stuff too. Having a clear proposition, really focus your resource. The people side, surround yourself with great people. Know your, know your purpose and know you're doing it not just for your own personal purpose, but make sure the business has a purpose too. Remember what those points of difference are. Do a competitor map and work out where you're going to be spending your every promotional penny. Know your audience. Understand that positioning side of things. And all that adds together to deliver profit. As I said, it's not a strategy in itself. It's a result. And I'm really going to hammer the P point here by saying something that, in my opinion, even better encapsulates, encapsulates this thing, which is to try and deliver profit with purpose. And that means the business is probably working. What you're doing is hopefully for the greater good. And it's likely filling you with a sort of purpose which will have you skipping to work, itching to ride the entrepreneur roller coaster and grow your own business. Finally, and I will be brief now, and I'm, I'm going to touch on the complex matter of raising money to launch and develop a business. The reality is that it's hugely complex, and I could probably run a whole term's worth of lessons on the subject alone. 
the bottom line is that there are countless sources and ways to do it. You could take investment in your business by giving shares in your business away, a bit like Dragon's Den, but where the risk for the investor is that they can lose everything. Or you could borrow money from a bank, um, investor or even ind individuals who'd be willing to lend, lend to you, where you're not giving shares away, but you will need to pay it back. And so if the business goes wrong, that can be quite a painful place to be. Um, you can talk to venture capitalists or private equity people, um, although it's more likely at an early stage that you're possibly talking to friends and family. And in the case of friends and family, I think you've mentioned that in your note, Caroline, there's also an emotional aspect to it, which really makes you not want to lose your friends and family's money. But remember, all investors have backed you for a reason, and all investors should also be going into that knowing that they could lose everything. But they have backed you because you've probably got all your P words lined up. Um, and with the caveat that you'll need to provide a product or service for that money, um, you know, you're 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 going to you're going to you're going to be able to generate the generate the, the, the interest that you've really wanted to. Um, so if I had one tip in terms of what I'd do if I was looking to raise money now, it would probably be about trying to uh, raise money through where you're talking about customer funded business. So um, all too often you think about the sort of alluring world of tech, where there are a huge number of businesses with ridiculously high valuations and the CEO is forever on a very stressful fundraising road, trying to raise money way before the business ever makes a penny of profit, and sometimes way before it even makes its first sale. But if you could go for a business where it's customer funded, um, and although clearly that is your customer's money, you are ultimately going to try and generate that product or service for them, but you are getting that money up front and it is allowing you to try and build some cash flow into your business and start growing your business. So that would be a strong recommendation. There's no reason why you, that can't be a tech business. And clearly a travel business like the one I've done uh, is a customer funded business. People are booking a holiday three months before they go away. Um, so we've reached the end of my presentation. I've probably gone on far too long, but um, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Um, I have also been, it's very important you know that if you do have any questions after the presentation that you or that this little window do come back either through Caroline your um, tutors or teachers and I'll be sure to follow up directly back through Caroline or whoever has approached me by the tutors um, Thanks, and, uh, yeah. so any questions at all I'm happy to happy to answer uh, well Ollie's kicked off um, with a great question here do you think you'll ever set up another business uh, uh, probably, yes. Um, I mean, it's, it's something of a sort of, um, you know, it's, it's something I love, I love doing. It, it gets me, it gets my juices flowing and whether it's setting up another business or helping an advise, advisor business, um, or being part of a business that's sort of growing again, that's, yeah, I, I think absolutely yes. Right now, I'm in also in a, a, a period of time where I'm, I'm technically not allowed to set up another business, so... <laughs> Thank you. So, I mean, I thought the, um, the what was it in the end? Eight Ps? Eight Ps, yes. Yeah, a brilliant, a brilliant structure, a great formula for starting a business. Why do you think, though, I think when we discussed this, you said something like 90% of startups fail. Why do you think so many businesses fail? Um, well, it probably won't surprise you to, think, to, to know that it will typically be down to the fact that there's no plan or there's a very minimal plan. There's no clear proposition. The governance is poor. Um, there's minimal knowledge of the market and cash flow. You yeah. haven't, haven't thought about cash flow. Um, so all too often, it's a. Uh, you know, we we quite often joked at Original Travel that there were a number of great businesses uh, and people we met within the industry who, um, you know, we, we, we'd always use the, the word the company called Patagonian Mountain Bike Tours. I don't think that there is a company called Patagonian Mountain Bike Tours, but we always always imagined that there's someone who's passionately running their business, that they know all about Patagonia, they're desperately passionate about Patagonian mountain biking, 
but they haven't planned their business properly. Um, and you do need both of those things. So it was one of my, or two of my earlier key words, that you need product and passion, sorry, three, product and passion, but you also need that planning side. Right, thank you. A uh, question here from Oliver. The role that you had in Bearings allowed you to travel as much as, as you, allowed you to travel a lot. Which role was that? What role was it? Oh, right. So I was a um, corporate financier initially in, um, gosh, in those days, it was all about whether you worked in specific markets. So my specialism was in emerging markets, um, which took me all over the Middle East and Africa, particularly Russia. Um, those are my main areas. And then as time went on, I built up sector specialism. My mind happened to be in um, telecom, nothing to do with travel at all. Um, and so as my specialism built, built in telecom, that took me to do specialist telecom deals all around the world. So as a corporate financier or investment banker, um, working on things like mergers and acquisitions and flotations of those businesses. Great, thank you. Um, Toby wants to know how you specifically raised money for your own business, Original Travel. Um, literally from our own pockets, and it was a, a, a really not a great deal of money. We start we started the business with a grand total between us of twenty thousand pounds. Yes, uh, you know, it, not, I'm not saying for a second that twenty thousand pounds isn't a huge amount of money, but between the three of us who founded the business, that was about the sum total of what we saved up, um, reaching our late twenties. So. Um, not, not particularly expert saving up until that point, bearing in mind it was across three of us, but that was what we needed. And as I said before, if you could get that business to be customer funded, you don't necessarily need to be having millions of pounds in your pocket. Now, two, three, what, no, gosh, four or five years in, we then bought in venture money and started to raise slightly more serious money at that stage. Thank you, Nick. That's great. Um, I have a question for Art from Archie here. Uh, he's thanking you for your talk. Um, he said, and I think this is sort of more generally, when you've made your business, do you then sell it or do you keep it? Um, can you answer that question? Yeah, I think so. I think it, it comes back to that, that question about purpose and why. Um, you know, some people want to run a business to build it up and sell it and pocket the dosh and buy their yacht and sail off into the sunset. Or some people will want to do that because they want to protect the financial future of their family or, or whatever the financial reason is. Um, but no, you, you could keep it or sell it. Or you know, some people would build a, build a business so that it could be in the family for years to come and you know, pass it on to family members in, in future. So no there's, no, there's no hard and fast rule there. And I, in, you know, in my case, I certainly didn't build it to sell it. I built it to create freedom. And that, as I said, was the, the key motivation for me. Now, whether, whether freedom was time, money, to be my own boss, whatever that definition was, and, and to a certain extent, it has as I said, it allowed me to have the freedom to make the important decisions I thought I had to make um, just before COVID hit. Right, thank you. Um, good question again from Ollie here. Your graph showed your business was successful from the off and continued to grow. We saw that line going like that. Were there ever, ever any moments when it felt in danger of not growing or failing? So one year only did it, and it grates with me. This is sort of, you know, the OCD in me. There was one year where it did, which was 2012. Um, and I often ask people whether they can guess why it was 2012. I obviously can't answer the audience. Maybe I'm going to ask you, Carolyn, why, why do you think it did? Why do you think it dipped in 2012? Uh, Dan? <laughs> Mr. Pullen, any ideas? Is, is Mr. Pullen anything to do with sport? Financial crash? No, so, so 2012 at the Olympics. Oh. Course. So the Olympics sat bang in the key departure. You know, it was summer holidays, um, and as patriotic as we all felt, um, we all wanted to stay here in this country to be part of it. And you know, yes, you could have watched it on telly, but you know, people just wanted to be part of it. So we had this small dip in the summer months. And it, I, when I look at my charts, I had this little dip in 2012 that annoys the hell out of me. But there it is. <laughs> Well, it's great that you had that that uh, line going up and that exponential all the way through. It was just one little dip. It wasn't exponential, I feel, but it was it was up at least. Yeah, exactly. Um, so going back to your early career, you obviously started out in bigger companies. You mentioned Procter and yeah. Gamble. 
do you think it's better it, you know with the benefit of hindsight to start your career in a small company if you want to then go and start your own business or to start in a large one and then use the skill sets that you learn there to apply to your, uh, to your it's, own business? it's really difficult um i think it's the horses for courses on that one i i certainly think that the planning side of the business was hugely enhanced by for me was hugely enhanced by my own experience from before because so i only knew you know, going from in the last deal I did was was to float orange, so multi-billion pound. Well, I mean, I wasn't me doing it. I was very much a, a sort of junior bod on it. But when you're talking those sorts of numbers and those sorts of levels of plans, and that's the only thing you know, that's the only thing I brought over to original travel. Hence, my two university friends looking slightly bemused as to why we needed you know thick business plans and financial models and big documents. Um, but I, you know, and probably it was too much. It was probably a little bit um, over the top. Having said that, that planning side definitely came from something before. So whether it is um, coming from a big business situation, whether it's coming from doing a master's, whether it's from coming from doing an MBA or you know, evening studies or strong reading, I do think that it is worth understanding a little bit more. I, I, don't I don't believe unless you can surround yourself with people who do have that experience I don't think you can just go for it from the off and expect to get it right Thank that's you. not to say that you know I, there in fact I introduced I briefly um, had a few calls with, a, with an old rally and who who is starting his own business and introduced him to my nephew who's also running his own business and sort of reasonably soon out of Edinburgh University um, and he went for it after two years post Edinburgh University and seems to be you know, making it really work. So anyway, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer there. Thank you. Uh, building on that point, how important do you think mentoring and guidance is when founding a business? And how is that process best defined and developed? I, whether it's mentoring or guidance or just having someone else. Um, so when you're, you know, when you're, running your own business. So whether, you know, whether you're the warden of Radley College, ultimately, if you're the person sitting at the top of the tree, it could be very lonely up there. You, you can feel like everyone is looking to you for the strategy and decision. And there are some things you desperately need to talk to other people about. Um, my wife certainly has always served that purpose for me. She's far more a student capable than me in the business world. Um, I also use an organization called YPO, which um, is an American business network, which is a fantastic organization, but it's got a sort of slightly Masonic feel about it, but it is, um, it is brilliant at going through this process of um, sharing. So I, I sit with a group of about seven people in ranging from little old original travel at one end of the spectrum through to um, the CEO of Paddy Power at the other end of the spectrum. And for a long time, I used to sit there thinking, what value can I possibly bring to Mr. Paddy Power? But actually what you quickly realize is that the situations and challenges that businesses face are all the same, whether it's just a matter of noughts. You know, you're talking about thousands of employees or tens of employees or billions of pounds or millions of pounds. It, it all comes back to the same thing. So if you can share... Um, in a reasonably open way, the challenges you're facing, and, and and you can do that in a in a safe and confidential environment, then it's amazing what you can get back in that situation, and how easily you can get away from from feeling lonely in that situation. So you're obviously mixing there with a lot of people um, who have started their own business. You've mentioned passion in your piece, but in terms of qualities of an individual, characteristics that are important to have if you want to be an entrepreneur. Could you tell me what you think they might be? Goes back to our Spartan energy drink. A lot of energy. I think you've got to be prepared to. Um, yeah, it's very long days. Um, I think resilience is really key. Um, I think you've got to learn to accept that it's a very very bumpy road, um, and it, you know, it really it really is like that. And you can think that you're completely nailing it and there's something comes out of the blue which absolutely rocks you um so it's that 
yeah, I think resilience is key. The ability to compartmentalize. You've got to realize that there are, you know, there are a million things that are going to come up and you need to prioritize and get the right things in order. So that comes back to the planning thing. But yeah, I would say energy and resilience on top of the things that I said before are probably two, two key things I'd, I'd make sure you have. Thank you, Nick. That's a great answer. I've only got one more question. So if anybody else wants to ask anything, then please do feel free to put it on the chat. My final question, Nick, is not related to entrepreneurism. You've clearly organized some pretty amazing holidays in your time. What is the most extreme holiday that you've ever organized? Um, this, is, this, is a, this is a very easy one to answer. It's one of those situations where we all ended up vicariously living through this client. So I was sitting in my office one day um, a few years ago when a, a guy came, literally walked in off the street, which never, never ever happens, but he walked in off the street and French guy and he he asked to speak to me and he came up and he said I'm not going to do a French accent but he he came up and he said the first thing he said is that I'm deeply ashamed and I thought God is you know the, the psychiatrist is the next door up you know I, I thought he just got the wrong place and I said well I've, gosh well how can I help you so well, I'm deeply ashamed of the fact that every holiday that I've ever been on has been a hedonistic cliche um, it's been skiing in Courchevel, it's been boating in Saint-Tropez, it's been partying in Miami, or it, everything, very great fun and had a lovely time, but I've never really, I've never learned anything. I've never, I've never integrated local cultures. I've never really looked beyond the end of my own nose when I'm in these places. So I have decided to take a whole year. Um, I've got a plane and I've got a pilot. Um, and my plane can land pretty much anywhere in jungle, ice, as long as I've got a reasonably short strip of land to put the thing down. And I want to go around the world, learning my way around the world. Um, and I don't want to stay in a single hotel. Can you make it happen? Oh, God, that is a tall order. Um, anyway, over the planning process, which took about three to four months, one year turned into two years. Um, and it, it involved building him a website. We wrote him a book. And sure enough, we sent him around the world with his pilot. Um, and during the planning process, a very beautiful 23-year-old German girlfriend appeared on the scene who, who joined up with him and joined him on this, this amazing trip. Um, and he, I mean, it was just extraordinary the things he did. Whether it was sleeping on the side of the road each night as he was motorbiking through Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, whether he was learning to um, dive underneath the, uh, the, the something called the sardine run down off the Eastern Cape in South Africa, filming the sardine run and then putting the, the film footage they, they had together with a BBC camera crew each evening to learn how to make better film, all this sort of stuff. And it was, it was the most wonderful thing to do um, and we became great friends and he and ended up inviting me on stages of his trip and um, it, was, it was fabulous. So that by a distance was, was, uh, was the most exciting thing to do and often actually made it easy to answer that question later down the line when a, when a client would come in and say, listen, we're taking, you know, normally we'd go on a two week holiday, but this year we're going on a three week holiday and we want to do three countries, not four countries. Are you going to be able to do it? And, you know, you try to say, well, I, I, yeah, we, sh we should be okay with it. Well, prove it. And you say, well, we did this one. Oh, okay, fine. Then. <laughs> yes, we can do it. Um. That's brilliant. Thank you. Great story, Nick. And, and thanks so much for your time, Nick. That was absolutely fascinating. We learned a lot there um, along the way. So I know you're busy, so we really appreciate it. Thank you. No problem at all. A great pleasure. I hope it was useful. It was. Now, before we all go, I'm going to tell you about the last two talks that we have lined up before a very well-earned half-term break. On Monday, we've got Jim Elliott, music producer and composer, who will talk about the different types of careers in music production and why the music industry is a booming place to be right now. And on Wednesday, we'll be combining both education and entertainment in the shape of Max Rendell, professional magician. He's going to talk about his career so far and the business skills that he has learned performing magic. Max will not be able to resist demonstrating his magical powers during this talk. So this is definitely one to watch. Just a final reminder before I say goodbye, please email me any ideas for career talks. It's much appreciated. And don't forget, you can watch any that you've missed on Radley Video. 
without further ado, I wish you all a lovely weekend. Thank you for attending and I hope you have a really good evening. Bye-bye and thanks to you, Nick. Bye. Thank you very much all. Have a good weekend, everyone.